Good, thank you very much. If I may call the proceedings to order. Uh, my name is Philip Karugawa. I'm with ENS Africa Advocates, uh, Uganda. I am privileged and honored to be the host, the moderator of this event this afternoon, um, to which I welcome you. This is an event on investor state disputes and the international disputes in the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. It uh, goes without saying, perhaps, that as our countries become more and more integrated with global finance, with big investors, with uh, drawing in money from other parts of the world, that you know, inevitably, as they will be in, in business relations, that when disputes arise, there will be concerns as to where those disputes are resolved and who will listen to those disputes. And that's where we have the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. To speak to us today, we have a panel of very, very distinguished speakers. And I will, I will introduce them right off the top as, as the whole panel and save when it comes to the actual presentations. So to start, we have Professor Hawa Kureshi. Queen's Council, he's the head of McNair International. He specializes in international arbitration and commercial litigation. He has been consistently identified as a leader in his fields of practice. He has undertaken high profile complex cases for and against commercial parties and state parties from more than 70 states with hundreds of appearances in arbitration and court matters. Okay, he's also appeared before the International Court of Justice on numerous occasions. He has taught commercial law at Cambridge University and King's College London. Um, he's got several recent matters uh, in several different uh, arbitration fora from the Singapore uh, SIAC to the London seated LCIA to the uh, appearances before the, the other, other fora. Yes, he's also, by qualification, he's got a LLB and LLM from Cambridge, a first class honors, and he's had numerous appointments. Uh, he has also published several books, including a book on bilateral investment treaty claims and uh, a book on conflicts of interest in international arbitration. Some of these books are available to us in soft copy and um, we will be able to send them out to you from the Society Secretariat. Um, yes, I'll say welcome, Professor, and I'm going to assume that the rest of the membership listening has also wel welcomed the Professor, uh, Professor Kureshi. Our next panelist is Professor Francis Botchway. He is the William Blair Chair in Alternative Dispute Resolution at the Qatar University. He holds four law degrees from four of the leading universities in the world, including Harvard, Dalhousie, Manchester, and Ghana. He sits as an arbitrator on international, uh, international commercial disputes and is listed on the ICSID role of arbitrators, as well as the Beijing Arbitration Commission. Yes. Uh, he's also published widely, including some two interesting titles which caught my attention, one on the African National Courts and the International Arbitration Tribunals, The Quest for Harmony, then Wither International Investment Law in Africa, and that's 2020. So again, I say welcome to Professor Francis Botwe. Noela Lubano is from Kenya and she practices with the law firm of Oraro and Company Advocates. She's a partner and recognized dispute resolution and arbitration expert. She has represented a Canadian-based energy company as co-counsel in the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes Proceedings brought against the government of Kenya in respect to the unlawful revocation of the company's geothermal license worth 312 million US dollars. 
She holds a master's degree from the University of Cape Town and a bachelor's degree from the University of Nairobi, Kenya, as well as a postgraduate diploma in law from the Kenyan School of Law. Welcome, uh, Noella. She's also a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Our order of proceedings will be that we will hear from Professor Qureshi, followed by Professor Francis Botchway, and then we'll hear from Noella. We will then take questions from the audience. In the interim, questions can be posted to the chat room. Um, the presentations will be mailed. They, you can rest assured if you, you, having registered for the event, we have your email address. No need to post it in the chat. Hmm. I'm doing a negative, <laughs> a negative commandment. I'm saying, please, we have your email addresses already. We will use them to send you the materials that have been shared. So once again, may I say karibu, karibuni wote and invite Professor Kureshi to start his presentation. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to join you. I'm sitting in England in the countryside. As many of you may be aware, today is the official birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. And for the next three days until the end of Sunday, there are celebrations taking place for her Platinum Jubilee. It's very quiet here, but there are going to be jets flying past central London uh, very shortly, which is why I'm probably better off sitting here where I am. I'm delighted to join you and I'm grateful to the East African Law Society for convening this event. I'm very pleased that my colleague, uh, Professor Francis Boschway, who is a member of McNair International and another colleague, Damilola, who I believe is online and a, a, an expert on, on energy disputes from uh, Nigeria, are uh, here participating with us. There is a substantial presentation if we go to the next slide, uh, Joseph Dyke, uh, one of my uh, senior associates is assisting me. You can see the contents of the presentation. It goes to some 42 pages. I'm going to stop at page nine. And you can what you can do is read this at your leisure because the objective of this presentation is to give you a, a clear background in investment treaty disputes, what, do they consist of and what are the key issues? If we can turn to the next slide. Philip mentioned ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Now, ICSID is a, a, an organization that sits under the World Bank. The ICSID Convention of 1966 has been signed, to by, signed up to by many states. The objective of this convention it's a multilateral convention because many states have signed up to it, is to provide investor protection. A home state, which is the state of the nationality of the investor, signs the treaty to ensure that the host state, which is where the investment takes place, does not treat the investor unfairly or deprive the investment of its substantial benefit. That's the sum total of investment treaty uh, protections. The ICSID regime is administered in Washington, and it only has really begun to take off in the 1990s. My first investment treaty case was in Ethiopia, against Ethiopia, all about the, the nationalization uh, and expropriation by the Marxists in the 1973. Seems a long time ago. Uh, since then, I've done investment treaty arbitrations involving many states. There's uh, there are at least one or two listed on this PowerPoint presentation in South America, in Africa, in Central Asia, South Asia, and the Far East. This is a, a an area that's expanding. In East Africa, we know that there are investment treaty claims being brought against East African states. And if you look at the statistics, last year, there were 66 cases registered. That's a substantial number. We're talking about more than one a week. And around about 15% are registered in involving Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. But if you include uh, the Middle East and North Africa, that's nearly a quarter of the cases. 
the main sectors, more than a quarter are oil and gas and mining. One of the issues that is a cause of concern, which many on this panel will be aware of, and perhaps Professor Poshwe will speak about, is the, the system as it stands at present. The arbitrators who deal with this, these matters are predominantly from Western Europe and North America, almost three quarters, whereas the majority of the disputes are from elsewhere. More than half involve South America, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. This is a matter that has to be addressed, and that can only be addressed if more of you on a presentation such as this and participating in an event such as this try to qualify as arbitrators and put yourselves forward. The other issue is, is gender balance or imbalance. Um, around about three quarters of the arbitrators are male and a quarter, just slightly over a quarter of female. That's changing, but we need more able individuals, not just from Africa, but who are female to come forwards and sit as arbitrators. That's a hint for you, Noella and others who are on this on this uh, webinar. One case has been filed this year so far that we're aware of, and that's against Senegal. If you can move on to the next slide. Now, arbitration. Many of you are familiar with this. Arbitration is a way in which disputes are resolved outside the courts. The main benefits of arbitration include that you choose it, that you choose the arbitrators, you choose the rules. Different institutions exist. You have UNCITRAL, which provides a model set of rules. You have the LCIA, London Court of International Arbitration. You have the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. And then you have trade specific arbitral rules. Ordinarily, it should be confidential. This is seen as one of the benefits. Unfortunately, this is less and less the case. It's supposed to be cheaper, but unfortunately, this is also less and less the case, principally because arbitrations are being overloaded in terms of documents, overloaded in terms of witnesses. The arbitrators are generally from a small pool, they're very busy, and as a consequence, there is delay. The benefits of arbitration are supposed to be speedier, cheaper, but also finality. Thanks to the arbitration uh, framework provided by the New York Convention of 1958, International arbitration awards, when they are brought for enforcement before domestic courts, they should not be the subject of an appellate review. The courts of do domestic jurisdictions where arbitral awards are brought to be enforced have very limited power of review. And generally, where a state's courts are slow in enforcing an arbitral award or are too curious in the arbitral award, effectively treating an arbitral award as if it was a judgment of a first instant court which they can reopen. That has a negative impact on the reputation of that state. And investors will add uh, some element to their calculation to take account of such risks. We come back to the point that Philip made right at the outset. Africa is a continent with vast potential. Africa is a continent where I have been privileged to do a lot of work for foreign investors, but also for a lot of African states. And this is an area that more and more of you as practitioners, whether you're acting for the state, whether you're acting against the state or advising clients, you need to be aware of the intricacies. If we can move to the next slide. In terms of investment protection, we're focusing on BIT cases and those under the auspices of the ICSID convention framework, but you also have investment protection in contracts. Contracts can include what are uh, called stabilization clauses, renegotiation clauses, where the state that signs the contract effectively promises that it will not change the regulatory tax uh, framework, or if it does, that it must try and renegotiate to um, create stability for the foreign investor. When we look at national laws, you can see that in Uganda, very recently, an investment code was enacted in 2019. In Kenya, you have the Foreign Investments Protection Act of 1964, the Investment Promotion Act of 2004, and you have in Tanzania, 
the Investment Act of 1997. Many of you will be aware of the fact that Tanzania at the moment, unfortunately, is facing multiple foreign investor claims, whether in the context of commercial arbitration or investment treaty disputes. And so it's extremely important for all of you to be aware of your domestic laws. The PowerPoint presentation provides you with a summary of those domestic laws uh, towards the end, and I shan't be going through those. I leave it to you to read those at your leisure. Other ways in which foreign investors protect themselves include seeking guarantees from the state. These can prove to be very expensive for the state. In my 32 years of practice, I've come across many cases where the sovereign guarantee is very widely drafted, including access potentially to central bank assets. The host state uh, ought to be more aware of the impact of such protections. It's also possible that in more sophisticated, mature states, political risks insurance is obtained. Export credit agencies in the United Kingdom and the United States of America also provide protection to their nationals for foreign investment. And when we say nationals, we'll see shortly that nationals means not just natural persons, human beings such as ourselves, but legal persons also. Uh, next slide, please. Since 1959, we've seen that more than 3,000 investment treaties have been entered into worldwide. At the moment, one of the major signatories for such treaties is China. And that's not surprising, given that China's commercial reach is ever expanding. As I mentioned, bilateral investment treaties are treaties entered into between two states. Multilateral treaties are entered into between more than one state. Within the European framework, we have a treaty called the Energy Charter Treaty, and we also have regional free trade agreements. The next slide, please. What is the purpose of a bilateral investment treaty? Let me explain the background. In the 1800s and 1900s, there were treaties that were entered into, described as treaties of friendship, commerce, and navigation. And whether they were treaties of friendship uh, is another matter, but they were generally entered into by the colonial powers to provide them with access to markets. And they were sometimes used to trigger war, invasion, and conquest. The idea being that trade, navigation was being impeded, the treaty was breached, and that entitled the foreign power to engage in armed conflicts and ultimately to invade and occupy. And no one's done that yet for a bilateral investment treaty. There's always a first time. What is the objective? To provide what is a level playing field where the foreign investor is treated fairly. That means that when the foreign investor comes to that particular jurisdiction, remember it's called the host jurisdiction, after they've made the investment, the state should not treat them in a discriminatory manner. It should not change the regulatory framework change the environmental framework, the tax framework, so that the investment is no longer uh, viable. The first such treaty was entered into in 1959 between Germany and Pakistan. That was in the context of a spate of nationalizations where states that had obtained independence were nationalizing the industries that were still connected to the colonial powers. And the concern on the part of their home states was that they had no protection apart from going to the domestic courts of these newly independent states. If you can hear there's a spitfire going ahead, it's about to move into uh, the area around Buckingham Palace for a major uh, aerial, uh, aerial display. If we move to the next slide, we see that Uganda has 17 bilateral investment treaties, of which six are in force. And there are also at least eight treaties to which Uganda is a party that have investment provisions. So don't just look for an investment treaty. There may also be other treaties that may be invoked by a foreign investor, which you may be able to look at if you're advising the foreign investor. Again, as I said at the outset, I see that we have nearly 200 people joining. You may be from Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, elsewhere in East Africa. You're all uh, most welcome. And whether you're advising the state, a state sector entity, or a commercial entity, 
These are issues you must be aware of. As you may take the view, we have a contract, it's subject to Ugandan law, Tanzanian law, Tanzanian courts. And of course, I don't expect any one of you to behave in, a, in an improper way. But sometimes what happens is the state or state entities take the view well, the foreign investor is in our country, is he or she or it is in our jurisdiction. Let's see how they fare in our courts over the next year, two, three, 10, 20, 30. And of course, the foreign investor's position is fine. I have an investment treaty, which gives me direct access to an investment treaty tribunal, where if I win, and I obtain an arbitral award, I can enforce that against any of your commercial assets anywhere in the world, which still comes as a shock to some states. Next slide, please. Kenya, which I've had the privilege to represent recently the Kenyan authorities in the Kenyan courts, and I've acted against Kenya in the past on uh, numerous matters, commercial matters. Kenya has 20 BITs of which 11 are in force, and it's also a party to eight treaties with investment provisions. Last but by no means least, if we look at Tanzania, Tanzania has 20 BITs, of which 11 are in force, and it's party to six treaties with investment provisions. What are these provisions? If we turn to the next slide. Uh, the, the next slide is Energy Target Treaty uh, introduction, but if we move beyond that to the bilateral investment treaties, what are the, the provisions? Firstly, under a bilateral investment treaty, there is a provision that identifies when the treaty enters into force. That's critical. Has it entered into force before the investment was made, after the investment was made? This can be critical. Has the treaty expired in South America in 2004? Quite a few states, Ecuador, Venezuela, tried to denounce the treaties, tear them up legally. But the treaties themselves contained a provision which meant that the treaty continued to have effect for another 10 years. And that's something you need to be aware of. So if a politician is tempted to tear up a treaty, remember, you can't do that. Coming back to the slide and what constitutes an investment. If you look, every kind of asset, every kind of asset. This is a very wide definition. Movable and an immovable property as well as property rights, shares, claims to money, intellectual property rights, business concessions. This is very wide. Next, what is an investor? Nationals and companies. This is a provision that has been criticized because it's suggested it can be abused. Now, how can it be abused? We have many jurisdictions where you can set up a company within minutes. And what's been happening is that people have been treaty shopping. It's alleged that what they do is they find a jurisdiction which is tax light, which is also light in terms of scrutiny. And it also happens to have an investment treaty in place with a state that they want to invest in. They set up a company there and they become a national of that company. As a consequence, they can take advantage of the investment treaty. They may just have a minimal presence in that state as a company can be formed with very little by way of physical presence, very little, if any, economic activity. As a consequence, new investment treaties often require there to be a substantial business activity for the nationality qualification to be invoked. And that seems fair because otherwise it's not unsurprising if there's a criticism leveled at these treaties that they are open to abuse and in fact are being abused because you can have a company set up by a national of the host state, let's say, uh, to take an example, state A, a national of state A sets up a company in state B, the company is the investor, and you completely ignore the fact that the owner is state A, unless the treaty provides differently, and unless the multilateral framework provides differently. And that many people take the view cannot be right. Uh, next slide. Thank you for all the greetings that we're receiving on the chat box. 
fair and equitable treatment. This is a very important provision. What does it protect? The legitimate interests of the investor. It requires the state to operate in good faith. It mustn't discriminate against the investor. And denial of justice means that the judges mustn't allow for there to be excessive delay in the proceedings. They must also treat the foreign investor fairly. If there's a judgment of the local courts, it mustn't be outlandish. It mustn't be irrational, because if it's outlandish and if it's irrational, that might well trigger the denial of justice. Next slide. Expropriation. This happens in two ways, direct and indirect, lawful and unlawful. It's permissible for a state to take the, the property, property rights and property interests of the foreign investor for the public interests under domestic legal procedure, so long as the foreign investor isn't discriminated against, and so long as there's fair compensation. The fair compensation standard means the market value, fair market value, just before the expropriation took place. Next slide. Question, what does constitute expropriation? It's whether the act of the state deprives the investor of the whole or significant part of the investment. And that might take the form of direct or indirect expropriation, as I indicated. As sometimes what happens is the state increases the pressure on the foreign investor through regulatory intervention, through uh, tax audits, through changing of the environmental framework, sometimes arresting the nationals, uh, making allegations of corruption. And there comes a point where the foreign investor just exits, triggers the investment treaty clause, and then un unfortunately, invariably, I say unfortunately, of course, when I'm acting for the foreign investor, I've acted for as many foreign investors as I have for the state. The foreign investor simply takes advice, invokes the, the bilateral investment treaty, and more often than not, unfortunately, the state, the host state, doesn't take it seriously. Sometimes doesn't appoint the arbitrators until it's too late, when the institution has appointed them. Sometimes ignores the timetable of the arbitral tribunal, which isn't going to make the tribunal happy. On the contrary, sometimes ignores directions from the tribunal for document production, document disclosure, and all of that feeds into a conclusion, an outcome at the end of the day, which may expose the state and its taxpayers to millions, if not billions of dollars of liability, some of which could have been avoided if the state had acted more robustly, more effectively in first reviewing the contract before it was entered into, second, undertaking due diligence with the foreign investor, making sure the foreign investor was uh, capable of performing the obligations under the contract, making sure the contract is commercially fair, realistic for the state as well as the foreign investor. And when a dispute was looming, ensuring that the state was ready to ideally negotiate so as to avoid a dispute. And if the dispute arises, to ensure that it fully engages with the process, whether it's arbitration, commercial arbitration, ICC, LCIA, or exit arbitration. Time and time again, unfortunately, particularly in Africa, as some of our colleagues will, will discuss, that has not happened. And that's to the detriment of the state, to the detriment of the taxpayers. But that's where the 207 of you who have joined this webinar can make a difference, because it's up to you to ensure that when you advise your state or you advise your foreign investors, that you advise effectively, and ideally, you seek a negotiated outcome if there is a legitimate claim that has been brought against the foreign state. The arbitral process needs more input from people like yourselves. You need to have much more representation in these proceedings. Again, I say, unfortunately, the vast majority of these arbitral proceedings, which I've been involved in dozens and dozens at the moment, I'm involved in a fair few, you will have huge teams of lawyers, largely international American law firms or Western European law firms, and the advocates from 
the domestic jurisdictions may have a small walk-on room, uh, whether for visibility or otherwise, that's another matter, to provide input on the local law insofar as it applies. There are other provisions under bilateral investment treaties, uh, which I'll just mention. There is one which is called an umbrella clause. And what that does is it allows potentially a breach of a contract to become a, treat of, a treaty breach. Now, this is a very powerful provision and sometimes state neglect it. The second that I wanted to mention is called, an, um, is called a most favored nation clause. What does that mean? In essence, there may be, as we mentioned, there are 20 BITs that have been entered into by Tanzania. Now, one of those may have better protections than the other. Now, if let's say the, one of the other 19 has what's called the most favored nation clause. What they can do is essentially cut and paste the more protective, the more favorable provisions from that one treaty and bring them into their treaty so that they can take advantage of those provisions. This is a, again, an important protection because what it does is it enables the foreign investor to look around, to examine other treaties and potentially argue well, the treaty between x and y is better than the treaty between z and y and i want to take advantage of that provision because we have a most favored nation provision in our uh, treaty that's where i propose to end the presentation with reference to these slides you're welcome to ask questions during the course of this webinar likewise if you want you're more than welcome to write to us if there's anything that we can address and we, we'll, we'll be happy to. Uh, I look forward to listening to our colleagues and your questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor. That was very, very insightful. I think you've introduced the topic well and covered sufficient ter territory for us who are just coming to town on this issue. And even those who may be a little bit more advanced than than most. Um, I really appreciate the call to action, inviting us to step up to the plate. If our countries are going to end up in exit, let's be the ones to represent them there. Let's learn these lessons and join these these panels. Um, I would like to encourage uh, the members to use the chat room to ask the questions, to post. Um, matters of relevance to this. I think uh, we are social beings. We love to greet each other. Yes, yes. And um, there's always space for that. We appreciate. But <clears throat> would like to make the most of, of today. Um, for the Ugandans, um, I'm going to make this a bit, uh, try and localize this question and ask about the recent case of Vinci Coffee, where the Parliament of Uganda has recommended the termination of an investment agreement with an, um, an Italian investor on the grounds that government in entering that agreement violated its own constitution. Looking at the test, Professor, that you gave us for expropriation, I am wondering if this isn't expropriation and you know, we'll wait to see whether Vinci has a right to go to exit. And perhaps that's a question I could put to you for later answer. Does an investor, foreign investor in a country fighting with the government have an automatic right to go to exit? Or do they have to have done the usual thing of an arbitration agreement and submitting to exit? Um, yes, we, we will, still with Uganda, if I just, may just mention, there's a new matter that has come up called St. Balikudembe Market, and the Attorney General put up a tender for, for legal advice support in relation to that arbitration. Historically, we know oil and gas disputes, heritage and tallow, I think were the first that got us, got Uganda into exit. There are other matters which I believe should have gone to exit, but never have. There was a near expropriation of a coffee, coffee estate, a coffee plantation in Uganda. We will ask for, for Kenya and Tanzania and our new member, DRC, I would be very keen to hear from anyone on this, uh, in, the, uh, in this room, 
uh, our new members from DRC, I should have welcomed them specially, and um, yes, Southern Sudan. So if we may now move to Professor Francis Bochway to share his insights on ICSID and its uh, relevance to us in this, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would also uh, like to express my gratitude to the East African Law Society for this opportunity and to uh, the over 220 people who are listening or watching us uh, today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just want to put some flesh on some of the things that Professor Kureshi has uh, indicated. So I will just walk you through uh, about three cases uh, which indicates an area where capacity was lacking or patriotism was absent. Now, most of the uh, arbitration issues that affect uh, Africa or most of the legal disputes that affect us actually uh, emanate from poor, poor drafting. It, the problem starts from the drafting stage. So drafting of you know, the legislation, which is you know, very wide and gives so many concessions, drafting of the contracts that gives the uh, investor such a wide latitude uh, including uh, the venue for any dispute resolution, even the choice of law. So we see the choice of law or the law that is uh, to govern the contract to uh, say English law, you know, when the investment is actually in Ghana or Sierra Leone, Kenya, Tanzania or somewhere. So the drafting is the key source of uh, much of our problems. Uh, thankfully, we are beginning to address it. And as Professor Kureshi uh, referred to the new law on investment in Uganda, uh, there are new legislation in Tanzania, which actually is uh, one of the reasons for the cases against Tanzania at the moment. Uh, new legislation in Tanzania, uh, sorry, in Namibia, uh, new bilateral investment treaty between Nigeria and Morocco, which have been held worldwide as a model for the future. Unfortunately, it is not uh, enforced uh, yet. So that, uh, there, there is some effort, there is some movement uh, on, on, the, on the drafting front. However, when it comes to the cases, we don't, see, we don't seem to be seeing a lot of movement in terms of rigorously and vigorously defending Africa's interests or African countries' interests. And I will just give you three uh, cases to uh, illustrate that. And as it is for diplomatic reasons, I've decided to choose cases for Ghana. I'm from Ghana <laughs> originally, so I don't want to offend anybody from anywhere else. So the first case that I will uh, uh, refer us to is construction partners uh, against Ghana. Uh, this was a case uh, that was brought by a construction company uh, owned by German uh, uh, investors, uh, Karl Plotner and, and his family. And they have been doing a lot of uh, road construction in Ghana. However, when there was a change in government in uh, 2000, that the new government didn't seem to be uh, in favor of, of the company. Maybe it was seen as being too close to the previous uh, government. And so a number of events took place and the, some of the contracts were terminated, others were frustrated. Frustrated in English sense, not in the legal sense. And so the company, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, construction pioneers uh, were, went to arbitration. They filed an arbitration uh, against Ghana. And due to a number of uh, lapses, uh, Ghana lost the arbitration. In, in total, it cost over 94 million euros, 94 million euros. In fact, because of problems of paying the, uh, the, the, the award, it, 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 it increased to over 100 million uh, euros by the time it was paid uh, in 2010. So how did Ghana lose? Ghana took almost two years. When the arbitration started, Ghana took almost two years before it did any filing in the arbitration. The tribunal was constituted in October 2003, and Ghana's first communication was on 6 May 2005. This was when a lot had been done, the uh, tribunal had been constituted, and a lot of work has already been done. In fact, partial awards of over 30 million euros were made against Ghana, and, and Ghana failed to file any response. Ghana did file some counterclaims when it came into the arbitration, 
but the counterclaims were dismissed for lack of jurisdiction because, and you have to remember, uh, construction pioneers was a German company. So they were very, very meticulous in keeping documents. And under the terms of the contract, Ghana was to notify them of any lapses or any breaches uh, at the time that the uh, breaches or lapses occurred. Ghana never did any of those. There was no documentation whatsoever. Ghana had no document, nothing to show any, any breach or any problem with their work until the arbitration. So the arbitration uh, uh, tribunal was quite uh, disappointed. And in the end, as I said, Ghana lost, Ghana had to pay maybe over 100 uh, million euros uh, in arbitration costs. That excludes even the cost of hiring lawyers. And there was one case uh, that I was involved in that the lawyers that represented Ghana, uh, in, I mean, charged Ghana, or Ghana paid about $8 million to the law firm from, from, from the United States to represent them uh, in, in that case. So the legal fees are not, are not cheap. On the average, it could cost about $5 million to get a law firm in, in the United States or Europe to represent a country or anybody. And they come, they may tell you maybe two or three partners are working on the case, but they come from an army of paralegals that all have to be paid for. So uh, going to arbitration is not cheap. So if we can do things, as Professor Kureshi said, uh, to negotiate or resolve the matter before it gets to that part, uh, we, we should do that. So that's what happened in the construction uh, pioneers uh, case. Now, in the, uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Richard O'Conn, had uh, said in, in the public lecture at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences and said that, uh, and I quote that's on the, on the screen, as you can see, uh, the culture of informality and contractual, uh, con contractual flexibility, which are significant features of interpersonal dealings in Ghana, including enforcement of commercial rights, is highly inappropriate. Indeed, it may be detrimental in international business transactions. And this is what happened in the construction uh, pioneer case. Now, this did not uh, end. There was uh, yet another case, which is very recent, and that's what Professor Kureshi was involved in that case, uh, but at the later stage, it was completely not his fault uh, in that case, as you will see uh, in a moment. In, in the second case, uh, GPGC uh, against Ghana, this is an electricity uh, company or energy company, uh, which uh, had a contract again with a previous uh, government. And when the government changed uh, recently, uh, the new government felt that the, uh, the agreement was not the, in the best interest of Ghana. And, and again, as uh, uh, the, the president of uh, the, the, the chair of the panel today had indicated, had asked in the case of Uganda, a parliamentary committee uh, was set up and recommended termination. They estimated that it will cost us about 80 million if we terminated. Uh, but if we continue with that uh, agreement, uh, we may end up paying for stranded cost or stranded power because the company will generate more electricity than we could consume. And based on the take or pay uh, provisions of the agreement, we end up paying over $40 million. Uh, so based on that calculation, uh, Ghana terminated the agreement. So the, uh, uh, the company, of course, went to arbitration. And in this arbitration, Ghana appeared to have taken it a bit more seriously. They participated, the Attorney General uh, Gloria Kufu uh, led the team, the Deputy Attorney General Solicitor General. They were all involved in the case and they hired a local Ghanaian law firm, uh, which also assisted them. Nevertheless, Ghana lost the arbitration and it, the total cost was about $137 million, uh, which was awarded against Ghana. There were some lapses in the arbitration that a very experienced uh, lawyer or counsel could have uh, dealt with uh, that could have at least reduced uh, the cost substantially, but that was not done. So after the, uh, the horses are bolted. Ghana then went to, because the arbitration was seated in, in, in England, uh, in London. So Ghana went to the High Court in England to try and set, it, uh, to set, set the award aside. The award was published in, on 26 January uh, 2021. 
uh, and three days prior to the expiration of the 28-day rule under English law, Ghana filed an ex parte application uh, for extension of time. Uh, that's three days before the 28-day period expired. So on the 22nd February, uh, an extension of time was granted by the court. Uh, this was on the deadline, on the last day of the original 28 day. So extension of uh, uh, time was granted on the 8th of March. But the court said that if, the, if Ghana were to need any further extension, it should make the application by the 5th of March, not the 8th of March. It should make the application by the 5th of March for that kind of, uh, for any further extension. Ghana did not do that, did not ask for extension, did not file any process for a month. Then it applied in, in the, uh, I think I forgot the exact date, but by the end of March, I think after almost a month from the uh, 20, uh, from the uh, uh, 8th of March, Ghana now applied for extension of time. And this uh, application was dismissed. So um, uh, the arguments that Ghana made for the extension of time were interesting. One of them was because of COVID, that because of COVID, key members in the Attorney General Department uh, were sick and then they couldn't, so they, 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 they couldn't file the re re requisite papers. That uh, the Attorney General, the current Attorney General, was not confirmed. He was going through vetting in Parliament. Uh, and so, you know, instructions could not be given and so forth. Now, the court said that argument is, is weak because if you are asking for a session based on COVID, you have to give particulars. You have to give further and better uh, particulars. You cannot just say COVID and then we move on from that. And this is important because uh, sometimes in our training, in our normal life at home, we take things for granted. We think you can just stand up, and it, it sometimes it stands from even practice in the domestic system. I have seen situations where a court has given judgment in default, and then the other party comes to court, and then it says, due to certain exigencies, we couldn't file the process. That's all. And the court accepts that. And that is bad training for us, because it will manifest in the international system, as it did in this case. And because the world is globalized, it is very, very easy to find information about people. So the other side presented information, and it was shown clearly that the attorney general who said he was not confirmed, he was for all the intents and purposes, was the deputy attorney general during the transition, I mean, in the previous government and during the transition, and he has been involved in the case from the beginning. Besides, he was doing other cases in the Ghanaian court, other constitutional cases in the Ghanaian court, when this, uh, this uh, arbitration was still pending. So he was actually acting, he was actually working and representing Ghana, but when he came to the arbitration, he adopted a nonchalant at attitude. So the arbitration, uh, the, the court in England said no, the grounds were not convincing enough for it to grant further extension. So Ghana lost $137 million uh, because of this. Ghana lost $137 million because of this. And that excludes lawyers' fees. In fact, the domestic law firm they hired in Ghana, they paid them about $1 million. And I can assure you, if they had hired a more experienced lawyer, certainly like ours, who would have done, delivered better results at lower price. I can assure you on that. But the, the, be it as it may, they made various mistakes, including this uh, nomination of the arbitrator. When it comes to nominating arbitrators, it's extremely important who you nominate. Ghana did not uh, take it seriously, and arbitrators were nominated without any, any serious scrutiny uh, from Ghana. So that's what happened in the second case. In the final, in the third and the final case I have is bank switch case. And this is uh, perhaps the most pathetic of the cases that I've seen. Again, there was a change in government, new government came to power, and the Minister for Trade, who was actually my uh, former classmate at the law school, uh, terminated this, uh, and that doesn't reflect on the law school or, or me or on our friendship, but it terminated an uh, agreement without proper uh, work or proper justification. So the company went uh, for arbitration. Ghana did not take the arbitration seriously. 
The notice for the arbitration was served on the 4th of March, and uh, Ghana filed a response about uh, maybe a year later. In fact, they filed a response only after they've uh, uh, appointed uh, or retained uh, a foreign law firm, Ashes. Ghana did not have uh, foreign lawyers until after a year, and they started taking the arbitration a little bit seriously after they hired foreign lawyers. But even the foreign lawyers were not very happy that I think eventually they left or they abandoned the case. That's because Ghana defaulted in filing a uh, counter memoria, defaulted in document production when the tribunal has uh, ordered for document production, Ghana de uh, defaulted. Failed to show up in pre-hearing, even teleconference, even in a, a system like this that we are having today, Ghana failed to show up on, uh, to, to participate in the teleconference. They failed to respond to questionnaire and they did not participate in the evidential hearing. There was nobody to challenge anybody, uh, to challenge the, uh, the experts from the claimants. And Ghana failed to nominate an arbitrator. So the, uh, uh, the, it was, this was the PCA. The PCA nominated uh, Gary Bond uh, as, Ghana, to, as Ghana's arbitrator, it's because Ghana did not nominate an arbitrator. So in the end, what happened? Ghana lost the arbitration, it was $78 million. And in this particular case, Ghana failed to honor it in time. And so enforcement actions were being taken against the country in South Africa, against our assets around the world, before they sat down to negotiate to try and pay uh, in installments. Now, the, uh, the tribunal said that you know, the state is uh, solely responsible uh, for uh, having failed to avail itself of the usual period or that of any extension when the arbitration was going on. Uh, this follows on from delays to the arbitration itself, for which, as it appears, the state was solely responsible. Why it has happened is not properly uh, explained. Now, um, if we continue, uh, we don't have a choice. So far as uh, we continue, uh, we, we are, the world is globalized, we are in the global marketplace, uh, we keep continue to invite investors to come to our country. We continue to uh, want to develop, uh, to reach, uh, to lift our people from our current situation. We will encounter these circumstances. It is up to us to prepare ourselves. We cannot continue to give excuses that, oh, you know, as the tribunal tried to even give excuse for us, that at times uh, things depend on political and budgetary factors. It has also, uh, uh, the tribunal also noted that no explanation was given for respondents' passiveness during the entire first year of this arbitration. This is inexcusable. People's lives are at stake. You know how much $1 million, uh, how much difference $1 million can make in our countries. How much, you know, we are desperate in, in need of money to develop our countries, to turn things around. And yet we continue to allow these things to go on. And the reason is this, because not many people are interested in arbitration. Not many people have been paying attention. Not many people have been taking it seriously. That's why governments can get away with things like that. Now, thank, thank God, we have about 200 people listening to us over this. That means that you are beginning to take it serious. You have to take it serious. You have to give the advice. You have to act promptly and be engaged right from the beginning. It is not enough to even have the technical knowledge. It is so important to be worldly wise and to be patriotic. If you care about your country, you have to care about these things. You, you have to be patriotic, you have to be technically sound, and you have to be worldly wise. As I said, when it comes to choosing arbitrators, you have to be worldly wise. We have a database that we know most of the famous arbitrators, the way they think when, when a state is a party in an arbitration. This will inform our choice, our contribution in terms of the choice of, our, uh, of the state's arbitrator. Many people, many countries, and many people in the local, you may be a famous local professor, but you may not have this wide, worldwide knowledge. And if you don't have that, you, your country may pay dearly for it. So I will stop here and await your questions. But I might just preempt in case uh, Professor Kureshi will answer the question about the Ugandan parliament uh, recommending termination. As I said, Ghana parliament did that and it paid dearly for it. Yeah, the breaches of the constitution is 
the response, the uh, com compliance with the constitution is the responsibility of the government, not of the investor. Remember the famous legal principle: you cannot benefit from your own wrong. I you can I can't come and say I've been negligent and so sorry. I mean, I you can't hold me responsible. You cannot do that. We have to bear that in mind before we get to that. So this is just a, I will I will end with this comment. If we can come back with further details. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor. A special thanks for from Uganda for that free uh, expert <laughs> advice. Thank you for your presentation with the examples from Ghana that have brought this home for us because as we are seeing you know we this is now globalization we are in one marketplace we cannot escape it the foreign investors will come here whether we invite them or not we need them okay and and you know when you're hearing the examples from ghana we need better administration of contracts on behalf of our of our by our governments and the the i liked the quote the culture of informality and contractual flexibility does not work in international commercial um, contracting. It's you know it's looking at a whole new mindset. The cases, the claims are huge. The consequences are, are very grave. You know because of this globalization and network, uh, the way we are networked, you never know when you send your national airline to land in a foreign country. <laughs> You hope it comes back. You hope it comes back. Yes, because you can't take it for granted and say sovereignty and so on. You can't touch my assets. Maybe in country, but you know we are now in a in a. It's a different world altogether. So thank you, thank you, Professor, and thank you, our participants. The questions in the Q and A box are awesome. Please keep them coming, and um, we will deal with that after our next speaker. Noella Lubano. Noella, you have the floor. Thank you. Sorry about that. I think I was on mute. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip, for the introduction. And thank you, the ELS, for inviting me. It's an honor, it's a privilege. And of course, I've, I've really enjoyed the presentations by the two professors and I'm, I'm enriched by it. Um, I have been requested to talk a little bit about the legal framework of exit in the East African countries. And I will try not to repeat anything that the professors have said because they have covered a lot of what it is that I would have covered. And um, I will also at this point ask for a disclaimer. I am a lawyer that is qualified to practice Kenyan law, but I am going to speak very briefly about the laws of other countries, that's Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And I might get something wrong, maybe due to recent developments that I'm not aware of. And so you will forgive me in advance if I am not extremely accurate on some of the legal topics that I will speak on. And, and just before I, I, I embark on, on, on this analysis, I, I like asking myself and indeed asking the audience, you know, why does it matter? Why is it important for us to have this kind of discussion today? Why have you taken time to sit here to listen to us and share our thoughts on this, on this important topic? And I think just to contextualize it, um, if you look at the history of ICSID and international investment law, you know, the underlying principle is that host states are not believed to be neutral in the adjudication of a dispute. And a foreign investor would like to enter into the arena of investment at a fair footing. And so this is the crux, this is the, you know, the, the backbone of international investment disputes, that an investor goes into a country and he invests there and his expectation is that he will be treated fairly, his investment will be protected and he will be able to defend any threats against that investment. And so once you contextualize that as a lawyer, you're then able to look out for the things that would appeal to this foreign investor or that would assist a foreign investor that has come to you in distress because his or her investment has been threatened. And um, there are a few, a few concerns that have been raised about the investment 
say, um, environments. And some of them are to do with pro-investor bias, where you hear that most treaties and most international tribunals are generally biased in favor of the investor. And then you also hear that the legal framework of investment arbitration provides for obligations against host states, but not any obligations insofar as the investors are concerned. And then you'll also hear criticism about the fact that it is only investors that appear to have the right to initiate investor disputes, yet states don't have a similar right. So these are some of the concerns that are being discussed in this space. And these concerns have led to some developments and emerging actions in various countries. You will see in some of the East African countries, the withdrawal from BITs. You will also see countries that have denounced ICSID and some that have amended their national laws to exclude some the application of some EITs. And so the hypothesis that you need to take into account is that a strong pro-arbitration legislative framework is good for an investor. It is, and it is in that context that I'd like us to look at the legislative framework of the East African countries. And when we look at it, um, I'd ask that you try and recall some of the things that Professor Quresh has talked about. Provisions that deal with national treatment, you know, legislation that provide for protections like most favored nation treatment, fair and equitable treatment, umbrella clauses, expropriation with compensation, investor obligations and strong dispute resolution mechanisms. And then don't forget to also look out for the general attitude of the governments of these states and the national courts. Because then those are the things that will inform John, who has the option of investing in any of the five EAC country states to build, say, a cement processing factory. He can do it in Kenya, he can do it in Tanzania, he can do it in Uganda, can do it in DRC Congo or Rwanda, but he wants to do it in a state where he feels his investment will be protected. And if it is under threat, he will be able to enforce his rights against that state. And that is the context that we must view international investment law. So if we start off with Kenya, I will only list some of the statutes that they have. And in, you know, it, it's, I think um, Professor Qureshi listed some of the important statutes and the ones that have um, investment protections, but I'll just list a number of them. In my review, we have the Government Contracts Act, which is a very basic act, um, doesn't contain any strong protections, but just sets out sort of the dry facts of if you contract with government. Then we have the Foreign Investments Protection Act, and that act actually provides for protections against the compulsory, fair, and prompt. It provides for compulsory, fair, prompt, and full compensation in the event of an acquisition or expropriation. We also have the Investment Promotion Act, and that one's a bit basic. It, it doesn't quite have any notable protections, but provides for rights of investors. Then we have an Arbitration Act. That's number four of 1995. And this one is pegged on the ancestral model law, which means it has limited grounds for setting aside an, uh, an arbitration award. And then it also applies to international arbitration. So it's a statute that you would have to look to if you have an investment dispute. And it also provides for the um, binding and enforceable under the New York Convention. And, and, and in that way, it deals with disputes in the international sphere. Kenya also has the Investments Dispute Convention Act, and this basically means that ICSID has been domesticated insofar as Kenya is concerned. So that an award rendered pursuant to ICSID is binding on Kenya, and an ICSID award is enforced as a final decree of the High Court of Kenya. And that's, that's an important point for you who may be representing a foreign investor who wishes to put a claim against Kenya. We also have the Public-Private Partnership Act, which foreign investors find themselves getting into, and it provides for a dispute resolution mechanism by way of arbitration. And arbitration is provided as the mandatory um, dispute resolution mechanism under that statute. And that's very protective because then you don't have to resort to the national courts. 
which are perceived in this case to not be neutral. We have the Mining Act as well, and arbitration is provided as a term of any agreement that is entered in Kenya under the Mining Act. Kenya also has, I think, about 19 bilateral investment treaties, and most of those treaties provide various protections, including um, FETs, expropriation without compensation, the principle of national treatment is recognized, most favored nation principle is also recognized, while a few of them do provide for umbrella clauses, and all of them allow for exit arbitration, and most allow for ad hoc arbitrations as well. Um, Kenya has also signed, ratified, and applies the New York Convention, which is utilized for the enforcement of uh, foreign awards and international arbitration awards. And um, as far as the Kenyan experience is concerned in the international sphere, I think it's had about four or five ICSID um, disputes filed against it. And um, all of them have been dismissed against Kenya. And Kenya has emerged successful in all five of them. I'm not aware of any decision in which Kenya has lost a case before the ICSID tribunal or in the international. So the attitude of the national courts in Kenya is that they're generally pro-arbitration, but there's a mixed record of the cases because there are some arbitral awards which were international that have not been enforced. But the general perception is that they are pro-arbitration. So that's Kenya. Um, let's go to Uganda. Um, Uganda has the Investment Code Act of 2019. And that provides for, I think, various provisions, nothing that stands out in terms of, um, of uh, benefits to foreign investors or protections that are offered to them. There is preferential treatment for ESC partner states and citizens, and that's useful if the party you're dealing with is an EAC national. And then some of the protections that are offered under that act is um, from compulsory, compulsory acquisition, and they require prompt, fair, and adequate compensation. And they also provide for alternative dispute settlement resolution between parties. And that includes um, through the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. And then the rules of procedure for exit do apply, bilateral and multilateral agreements, and any other international machinery for settlement of investment disputes. Um, in Uganda, I understand that the investment certificate issued to a foreign investor may specify the mode of arbitration, and that is deemed to constitute consent of the government to submit to that mode of dispute resolution. And invariably, it would be arbitration, it would be exit jurisdiction, ICC jurisdiction. However, if no agreement on arbitration has been reached, you can get recourse from the High Court for any remedies, including those in respect of expropriation. Uganda also has a Public-Private Partnership Act, and the settlement of disputes under that act is also by arbitration or as agreed by the parties. Um, Uganda has a very robust Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which is modeled on Encetral, but with certain key differences, which I can't, I don't have time to go into. But what that means then is that the grounds on which an award that is issued against a party are very limited. They can only be set aside on very limited grounds. Um, the Arbitration Act of Uganda applies to arbitrations administered by international institutions. It recognizes awards made under arbitration agreements in a foreign state and it recognizes the New York Convention. An award is binding and may be relied on in legal proceedings. We can enforce a New York Convention award as a decree of the court. And it also recognizes expressly the exit convention awards to be of the same force as a decree of the court. The enforcement of an exit award is by way of registering it in the courts. And so that's another jurisdiction which has put in some protective mechanisms um, through the exit framework for foreign investors. It has about 17 bilateral agreements and most of them provide for an automatic right to recourse to international arbitration in the event of a dispute. Other developments in Uganda include that they have a model production sharing contract which provides for arbitration under exit. As you know, there's been a lot of um, 
exploration activity in the recent past in Uganda and the model production sharing contracts have been introduced with this provision in them. And then their mining act also provides for international arbitration in the event of any disputes between parties regarding any mining activities. They've had, I think, three exit cases pending or concluded. So um, the other country that I quickly want to talk about is Rwanda. And Rwanda has passed the law relating to investment promotion and facilitation. And that particular act is extremely detailed insofar as investor rights are concerned. It provides for the national treatment principle. It has protections against expropriation of investments without compensation. It provides for amicable settlement of disputes and has the option of referring disputes to an arbitration agency as agreed by the parties. If no arbitration is provided for, you may refer the dispute to a competent court. Um, you can apply for an investment certificate to qualify for any of these investment incentives that um, are available in Rwanda. They also have an Arbitration and Conciliation Act, and in my view, it's among the most progressive arbitration acts. Um, it's based on the ancestral model law. It applies to both domestic and international arbitration. It defines what an international arbitration is, and awards in international arbitrations are recognized as binding, irrespective of the country in which it was made, but subject to reciprocity. So that's the rider when you're in Rwanda or you're trying to enforce an international award in Rwanda. You must show that that, that party, its whole state would receive um, similar treatment. So there's a reciprocity requirement. It signed about nine VITs, but it's not very clear, at least from my end, how many are in force. Um, in terms of ICSID, it has signed, ratified, and has had ICSID in force in its country from the 14th of November, 1979. It's had several cases, um, I think most of which before the ICSID tribunal, most of which have been discontinued, and I think there is about one that is pending. Now, the attitude of the government and the national courts of Rwanda is they're extremely pro-arbitration, and they have established KIAC, which is their um, arbitration sort of administering body to implement any arbitration efforts in the country, and that has done very well. Um, there's been an increase in investment, and like I said, the hypothesis is, you know, foreign direct investment increases contemporaneously with a strong arbitration legal framework or a strong investment framework. So um, we understand that the courts are yet to set aside any key administered, administered arbitral award and their ministerial instructions setting model dispute resolution clauses in international contracts involving Rwanda. And those model international dispute clauses are supposed to assist in giving foreign investors comfort that their investments will be protected and can be effectively defended in the event of threat. They also have a pro-arbitration set of Supreme Court instructions and policy on enforcement of our words. So directions have also been issued to the Supreme Court so that they're extremely pro-arbitration pro, pro as a jurisdiction. They've ratified the New York Convention on the 31st of October, 2008. So Tanzania has just passed, um, so Tanzania has various statutes and, I, and I'll speak about Tanzania as the last country. I won't go into the other countries just because of time, um, but Tanzania has an Investment Act 1997 and it has various protections and guarantees. This includes um, prompt compensation that is fair and adequate. It has a right to access of the court or arbitration. And it also requires that or provides that disputes may be submitted as agreed by the parties to the arbitration laws of Tanzania or to ICSID or within any bilateral or multilateral agreement framework. So they allow for that in there. They've also passed a very progressive and new arbitration act that um, recognizes international arbitration within it. Um, it also is, um, it also recognizes ICSID and ICSID was signed as a convention in Tanzania on the 10th of January, 1992. 
Now, the New York Convention, unlike the other states that I've talked about, was ratified on 12th June 1965. However, um, there's never been incorporated into municipal law in Tanzania. So there's an argument as to whether it has come into force and is operational because it has not yet been domesticated insofar as Tanzania is concerned. Um, the Public-Private Partnership Act of Tanzania provides for disputes to be resolved through negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. And then it's signed about 19 BITs with um, 10 European countries, five Asian countries, and four other countries. Now, Tanzania has been the, the has been a respondent in six exit cases. And um, some significant awards have been made against it. And because of this, there's been a bit of a reaction um, in Tanzania um, that, that has led to the termination of some BITs. I'm aware that the BIT with Netherlands and Switzerland signed by Tanzania has been terminated. And there has been a review and, and renegotiation of Unconscionable Terms Act, which allows Tanzania to renegotiate what it can consider as unconscionable terms. And this would extend to some of the protections that are offered to foreign investors in some of these statutes. And then there's the Permanent Sovereignty Act that was passed, which prohibits investors from resorting to international dispute resolution mechanisms or any foreign tribunal. And then they have the Public-Private Partnership Act, which requires all disputes arising under the PPPs to be adjudicated by judicial bodies established in Tanzania, that means they can only go to the national courts. And um, I will beg to stop there with one question. I want to go back to John, who wishes to establish a business in any of the four or five East African states, and is looking for a state where his investment will be best protected and you know, he will be able to defend any threats to his investments adequately. And I leave the question to you, the audience, where would you tell John to set up his business? And I'd like to end there. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, Noella. Fantastic, thank you very much for that very, very uh, informative survey of the East African community. We have received your apologies for the countries that you did not mention. It is fascinating and one is, you know, I must ask, given the wide disparate, uh, uh, you know, uh, what am I looking for? Legal arrangements we have for dispute resolution. Can we really say that we have a community? Are we working towards a common market? You know, uh, listening to what Rwanda has, listening to what Tanzania has done, even prohibiting international <laughs> international arbitration. You know, you're talking about John wanting to come and set up in these countries. But we, at least speaking for my president, when he pitches for investment, he says, come to East Africa community and access over 100 million people. So he's talking about all of us. But if we are going to treat these investors, the same person we're attracting, in all these different ways. Um, I think there's room for us to talk, first of all, amongst ourselves as to what we are going to do if we need this, this capital. Now, I'm going to invite the, the, my panelists. First of all, big thanks to all of you without, for, for the excellent presentations. I'm going to invite the panelists to pick questions from the chat room, the Q&A room, and I must give big, big thanks to those who have posted their questions there. I see questions about being patriotic. I see, um, although Noella mentioned that sometimes it will be us to represent the foreign investor. So I think our duty is to the law, to justice, to the cause of justice. Then I saw questions about standardization clauses and stabilization clauses creating a level playing field between investors and host states. Does ICSID work when it's the host state reporting a defaulting investor? We have a big hole in the ground here in my neighborhood where an Italian investor is supposed to have done a hospital. We have paid huge amounts for it, but um, 
the whole is not treating anybody. Uh, consequences of withdrawing from multilateral investment treaties and um, yes, among the questions. So the panelists, please pick your questions at leisure. We will have, uh, I'll say, um, six minutes for each of the three of you, and then we'll thank all the participants. Yes, let's start with Professor Kureshi. Six minutes. Firstly, thank you, Noella. Thank you, Francis, for your insight. And um, we see now we have 260 people who've joined, so even more. What I wanted to address are the two of the issues that have been raised. The first is whether or not a challenge to jurisdiction is worthwhile. Given what Francis has just explained to you, and he mentioned the case that I was involved in, and I can tell you, I had serious concerns about the way in which that case had been dealt with. I am reasonably confident that if Ghana had had access to more sophisticated legal advice, the arbitral award may have been rendered in a different way. That comes to the point of challenging. If you uh, look at how commercial parties enter into agreements, sophisticated per commercial parties, there are two points for them. Firstly, is it viable for us? Second, how much have I protected myself in case something goes wrong? These are the two critical points for a commercial party. Why should a state not behave in the same way? Firstly, is it viable for us? Have we given this concession to the right party? Are we getting what we ought to get? And have we protected ourselves in case this goes badly wrong? When it goes badly wrong, are we doing everything we can to limit the damage, to limit the exposure? And on all of those points, as Francis has identified, unfortunately, many of the states have still a long way to go. But that's where you all come in. There may be some of you from the state sector, there may be some of you from the private sector. And I can tell you from my own experience, I don't accept that it's impossible to change. Noel has referred to Rwanda. Let's not forget what happened in Rwanda 26 years ago, 27 years ago. It's not that long ago. We had carnage, we had genocide. Now, Rwanda is considered to be the place for arbitration in Africa. In fact, you even got the, the, the United Kingdom government wanting to send refugees from England to Rwanda. Uh, so long as, of course, they're, they're not from certain jurisdictions. <laughs> I, I, I will hesitate to identify which jurisdictions are excluded and which are included. But that's how safe Rwanda has become from the UK government's perspective. Why can't all of the other countries be similar? It's inexcusable. It's absolutely inexcusable. That's down to the legal community. It's down to the professionals. It's down to all of you to represent your countries as fully and effectively as possible. Of course, mistakes will always happen. In England, we've had contracts for PPE where billions of pounds of taxpayers' money has been wasted at best, if not worse. We can all learn lessons, but it's open to you, all of you, and to take away from this session what you can do, and that includes read the PowerPoints, ask more questions, take training, get involved, and demand more uh, from yourself. You have no excuse. There is plenty of information on the internet. All of you have access to the internet, otherwise you won't be able to join this. So that's the first point. Second point is, so far as enforcement, time and time again, states don't take this seriously. The example that Philip gave is a real life example. I can tell you that there was an African state whose assets were frozen at the behest of my client because it failed to comply with an arbitral award. I represented the foreign investor and the attorney general of this African state who met me subsequently was very upset with me, but the very same state then instructed me to act for it. You have to take this into account. As I said to you right from the outset, two questions if you're representing the state or the commercial party, how viable is this arrangement? Have we protected ourselves to the best extent? Whether you're for the commercial party or with the state should be the same considerations, exactly the same, only two. Hence enforcement, don't ignore the fact that any commercial asset of the state anywhere in the world, oil sale proceeds, 
the sales of natural products, ships, aircraft, receivables can be seized anywhere in the world. And unless the country is somewhere like North Korea, when there are very, thankfully, there are very few North Koreas on the planet, you will have to use foreign currency, dollars, euros, pounds, and you're exposed as the state. That, Philip, is where I wanted to end and say once again, it's been a real pleasure to participate in this forum with everybody else, my colleagues, and I, and I hope it's been useful for all of the, the attendees. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much, Professor. Amazing, amazing insights. We are most grateful. It's always a pleasure having you uh, talking to the members of the East Africa Law Society, and you've also spoken to Uganda Law Society. We appreciate your expertise. We'll now invite Professor Botwe to um, answer a couple of questions that may have been directed at him in the chat. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, relates to if uh, laws are changed, the consequences of changing uh, investment laws or even uh, the uh, bilateral investment. Now, I think the um, it is quite clear, and it is the principle in almost all countries. Uh, it's one of the fundamental principles of rule of law that laws do not have retroactive effect. So, if uh, new laws have been passed, the previous laws, uh, if the rights rights were acquired under the previous laws, under the old laws, those rights may be enforceable. The new laws will not take retrospective effect to extinguish previous right, previous uh, rights acquired under previous laws. So that's the first thing. There is also a question about the capacity of African states, uh, especially pe with patriotic uh, mindsets. I think you first you have to be a human being. You you have to really uh, care about your people, you know, and you have to have. Uh, you have to be smart enough to, do, to know that you as an individual cannot be rich when your country is poor. If you say you're a very rich man from uh, Nigeria or Ghana or Somalia or Ethiopia, uh, it doesn't count very much. You will still you will go through the same processes that all Africans go through, through airports and everywhere. But if your country is rich, is as rich as say Singapore or Switzerland, or Belgium, you don't you even, no matter your salary or no matter your financial situation, you'll be accorded respect. So as an individual, we have, as individuals, we have to be smarter to know that we are not rich until our country is rich. And so as a lawyer who is working for the government and you are being paid, or for some reason, you look the other way, as it was shown in some cases in Ghana, and then you get something in, in the, from, from behind, or under the table, you're actually hurting yourself. And the person who is giving you this so-called incentive actually doesn't respect you and doesn't value you, he believes you could be bought. So you, we have to be smarter than that. And that starts from the school system, right from primary school to secondary school to the universities. We have to have a patriotic mindset that nobody can build Africa for us. Nobody can build Tanzania than uh, by Tanzanians. Nobody can build Kenya except Kenyans. Others can do their best, but it will not be uh, enough to transform the country unless the people from the country actually uh, contribute a substantial part. And, and that brings me uh, to the next question that Amandus has asked, which is the correlation between bilateral investment treaties and attraction of investment. I must say that the jury is still out on that. There have been a number of studies, uh, Tazini, uh, various other people have done studies, uh, Guzman, and I would say that it's not conclusive that having you know, uh, bilateral, very liberal bilateral investment treaty actually attracts investment. That, th that argument is not conclusive. And you can see from countries which have developed without a lot of bilateral investment treaties, maybe Malaysia, uh, but even Western countries, Many of them developed without bilateral investment. When they had bilateral investment treaties, they were looking to protect investments that are made outside, which will bring returns to their countries. So there is no, it's not conclusive 
that having liberal bilateral investment treaties equates uh, development. Qatar, for example, has about 20, about 22 bilateral investment treaties. Many of them were signed after the country became rich. So the key things to a country developing or the key things to a country attracting investment are as follows. First, rule of law. You must have a culture of rule of law, including respect for the judiciary, well-trained judges who uh, uh, have their allegiance to one and only one thing, the fidelity to the law. So you need to have that. Rule of law is extremely important. Second, security, physical security, uh, so that people will feel safe in being the country. And then, of course, economic security, that your assets cannot be taken away from you just because there's a change in government or because somebody doesn't like the way you look or anything. And then the third thing that will contribute to a country's development is education. So if you have these three things, if you have rule of law, you have security and you have education, investments will flow to your country no matter what. The World Bank has done a study that shows that 70% of a country's development hinges on these three factors. So it's not natural resources. If it were natural resources, Singapore, South Korea, Japan will not develop. About 70% of Japan is almost mountainous. Less than 1% of the land in Qatar is fertile for agriculture. Whereas maybe 70, 80, 90% of the land in Uganda or Ghana is suitable for agriculture. But Qatar is developed and Qatar even exports agricultural produce. So you need these three things to develop. You need rule of law, strong culture of rule of law. Second, you need security, physical and economic security. And third, you need education. So if we pour all our resources into these three things, our countries will develop because it's not only the foreign investor who needs rule of law, but the local investor needs rule of law. When you buy land, you want, you want to be sure that the papers are correct and it's done quickly and it is secured. In many African countries, I know for Ghana, it is very difficult to get freehold land. But so how do you give somebody a leasehold to build a hospital or a factory for 25 years or 30 years or 40 years? That is no security. After 30 years or 40 years, what is it to do? You should move the factory away. But if you go to England, you can buy a house, even if you are not British, you can buy a house on freehold. So it is very important for us to have strong culture of rule of law, strong security, and strong education. These are the things that have made countries like China and the rest develop. It is not natural resources. We can have abundant resources, gas. Look, we have Nigeria has more resources than uh, United Arab Emirates or than Qatar. Venezuela has more oil than uh, Belgium. So it is not the resources, it is the human resource that is very important. Resources count very little if you don't have highly educated, technically uh, sound, and patriotic people to administer your country. If you don't have that, you will not develop. No matter, you can make your country free. Anybody can come and take anything and go, as it is happening in some countries, foreigners come to our country, they go to mining areas, and they take the gold, and they pollute our waters, and they go back, and sometimes they produce the things that we have, and then they advertise this as pollution-free. So your resources will not develop your country until our minds are properly developed. That is all. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, Professor Boche. That's very exciting challenge to us and what we must do as Africans, as owners of this country, to protect, uh, promote investment, uh, draw in the needed capital, protect our countries, and make sure that this money does what it's supposed to do. Uh, Noella, you have the next six minutes. Apologies to everybody that we are behind schedule, but we will conclude within the next 10 minutes. I thank you for your patience. Noella, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. And I think um, following what the two professors have said, I mean, there's, there's nothing much that I can say other than to concur with their sentiments. I don't think I have much to add in the context of the, the issues they've covered and the questions they've answered. So I just want to spend this um, two minutes or so, um, perhaps giving a bit of my own personal experience and view insofar as an exit international arbitration is concerned. 
And I think um, one of the things that are important, and this goes to Madeline's question, why has Kenya been extremely successful in all their investment disputes before ICSID? And I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of some of the factors that Professor Botre has talked about, you know, the, 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 the culture of, of how you deal with international arbitration. But I've also seen that there's a lot of collaboration between Kenyan Council and Council from other countries that have a wealth of experience in these areas as equal partners. And, and that is useful because whilst as Kenyan Council and as local council, let me use local council, you are extremely competent and probably overqualified to argue the dispute before ICSID, which is has a governing law clause of your local country. There are various um, other things around an arbitration that have got nothing to do with the technical expertise of the team that you may not be familiar with. And it's always useful to have another council from another country or another firm that is experienced with these issues to hold your hand along the way. Um, that's, that's the first thing. I think the second point is um, something I call imposter syndrome. I think we always feel when we get into the international plane that we are either inferior or we're in the wrong room. And I think it's, it's extremely important that you understand that the fact that you can litigate before a local court competently guide your clients and obtain a successful judgment, you can do the same before an international tribunal. The, the things that you need to do are not so different. So there is really no need to have any imposter syndrome when you are there or to defer to other councils who are not locally qualified to you know, to, to, to address the dispute, which is governed by the law that you are qualified to deal with and, and you're competent to deal with. Um, the other thing and the third thing is, I think it's important that you also understand that in the international plane, there can be a clash of cultures. Um, you know, there's an African culture, there's a Western culture, there's an Asian culture, and, and, in, and all these come to a boiling point, pot in the international plane. And a clash can arise simply because of these misunderstandings of culture. And it's important that you are aware of the potential of these interactions clashing because of the cultural differences among the different councils who are drawn from very diverse backgrounds. And, and I'd urge you to view them not as something negative, but as something that is a learning experience and as a way of understanding other cultures but not to feel um, discouraged by all these um, challenges that may come your way. And I think, um, I think that is all I wish to say. And I, I'd really like to see more women in the international arbitration space. I'd like to see more Africans, you know, more local people leading or being co-counsel in cases and successfully defending the rights of our states or the rights of the foreign investors that we represent. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Noella. You've ended that on a very passionate appeal, and we thank you for it. Uh, it's now 15.43. We are 13 minutes over our scheduled time. First, I would like to ask some IT to show me how we do these uh, friendly, smiley images, because I would like participants to send in the images as we say thank you to our distinguished panelists, Professor Qureshi, Professor Botchwe, and Noella, we are giving you honorary doctorate. Thank Dr. Lubano. I need yes. it. You need it. Take it with blessings. Take it with blessings and claim it. Yes, we give big thanks to our panelists for their excellent presentations. The slides, yes, the images are coming through. I didn't, I couldn't find the button, but thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Please send those images. We want to see the love. We want to see the gratitude. So please send those things in. Yes. So. The, as promised, the slides will be shared. You registered for this, it's online. So we will be sending them to the address you used to register. Thank you very much to the members of the East Africa Law Society who've attended this with such passion. I think we went up to 260 members at one point. And from the questions, I see a lot of interest and a lot of expertise. I'm now going to ask for a show of hands, again, using those emoji things to vote 
and ask East Africa Law Society to have a bigger international event, maybe with, um, you know, face. This time we meet each other and we see and shake hands. Isn't COVID something that we can manage now? We are living with it, okay? So let's see those hands and say, yes, 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 yes. Yes, uh, those are two hands. Yes, yes, yes. I think uh, East Africa Law Society will get the message. At this point, I'm going to thank everybody for your time. We appreciate you all. Santeni, Kwaheli Akuonana. You may leave at leisure. Thank, thank you. Asante sana. Asante sana. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.